friends! Starting or restarting ballet can be really, really overwhelming. So today we're going over seven mistakes that almost everyone makes when starting or restarting ballet. These are mistakes that I've made a lot, and so I'm kind of using this video as a reminder to avoid these pitfalls myself. So first up is getting all the gear and getting the wrong gear. It can feel like we need to buy all the things, the full kit, when we're starting a new hobby, a new interest, a business, whatever the thing is. And ballet leotards, skirts, and warm-ups are so, so beautiful. I mean, spend five minutes looking at Elevé, Ruby Aware, Lucky Leo, or Catherine Morgan's leotard collection. I worked in a ballet school for almost a decade and I saw a lot of students show up to their first class with all the gear and oftentimes the wrong gear. So think things like shoes that are actually meant for gymnastics, swimsuits, doubling as leotards, or even point shoes to a very first class. The easiest way to get started will always be to reduce friction or remove as many barriers as possible. So wearing a t-shirt and leggings is perfect for a ballet class really anything that you would wear to yoga. And most people have this at home already, so it's free. We love a free option. <laughs> the one caveat here is that while well, technically you can do class without any more equipment, you could do class in a pair of socks, it starts getting a little bit more dangerous and slippery when you move from the bar to the center. And so I do recommend buying a pair of shoes. These are the ones that I have. I really like them. They match your regular shoe size. They're about 20 to $30, so it's not overly expensive to buy off the bat. And it means that you're dancing a little bit more safely in class because you have the proper traction for the special flooring in the studio. So I do recommend buying these. Number two is limiting beliefs, negative self-talk, and fears. I'm not graceful enough. I'm not flexible enough. I'm not skinny enough. I'm not strong enough. Whatever it may be, the I'm not enter something here, to do ballet. These are limiting beliefs, which officially are a state of mind or a belief which restricts you in some way. The funny thing is, we would never talk to our friends like that, but we talk to ourselves like that, and these are stories that we tell ourselves that are probably not actually true. I've told myself pretty much all of these things back when I was dancing as a teenager and now that I'm dancing as an adult, and there's been this gap in time and yet this negative self-talk and these stories still remain. I had an especially hard time coming back to ballet because I felt like I came back with a really different body and a really different level of technique and ballet fitness, and so there was a disconnect between my previous experience and how I was as a dancer and my experience now as a dancer, and I had a hard time with that. I actually found it kind of frustrating, and I felt almost like I was foreign in my own body and foreign in this activity that was such a big part of my life. There are still days where this little cloud of negativity follows me around, but the thing is, with limiting beliefs, we actually subconsciously seek out information, people, experiences that will confirm this belief. And there's a term for it in psychology called confirmation bias and it's completely subconscious. We don't do it voluntarily, which is why it's so important to seek out other perspectives. So your peers, teachers, different studios, different communities in ballet that will help shift your perspective or at least give you an idea of what a different perspective could be. To start off, I would ask yourself, if a friend came to you and said, hey, I'm gonna start ballet, how would you respond? Number three is evaluating after taking only one class. So I've heard a few times people leaving a class for their very first time saying, that wasn't for me, that was too strict, I'm not flexible enough, I'm having a hard time figuring out what's going on and keeping up, and then stopping there. But the thing is, like everything else, not every class, teacher, or studio are the same. And ballet takes some trial and error to find the right fit for you. Often, it's not as clear as this teacher or studio is good or bad. To me, it's a matter of finding a class that fits your current level of ballet knowledge. So your steps, music how easily you can pick up an exercise when the teacher shows it, your ease and comfort with the logistics of a class and how it runs, and being in that environment. And then matching that level of ballet knowledge with your level of ballet fitness. So if you're brand new to ballet, your level of ballet knowledge and fitness are quite low. If you have trained a lot as a kid and are coming back after a long break, your level of ballet knowledge is higher, but your fitness might be lower because you haven't done it for a while. And if you're in the full swing of taking classes regularly, you're level of ballet knowledge is higher and your ballet fitness is higher. So these are three very different stages to be in when going to take a class. There's also a matter of the teaching style 
and the environment of the school. The moral of the story here is go try a lot of classes, teachers, and studios, both in person and online, so that you can find something that feels like the right fit for you. Ask yourself some questions. Do you feel like the class is moving at a good pace for you? Do you enjoy the environment? Do you feel welcome in the school? Do you feel welcome in the class? Are you getting corrections if you want to be getting corrections? But all of this necessarily means that you need to take more than one class to really get an idea. Number four is assuming that the class will teach you everything you need to know. Basically any beginner class will assume a base level of knowledge or will assume something is common sense or will assume that you will learn it through osmosis as you take more and more classes. And while that's true, I always think it would just be helpful for someone to teach it from the get-go. I'm very fortunate in that I trained a lot as a kid and a teenager and I come to classes now with a base set of knowledge of how a class operates and I don't have to overthink these things. Things. But a lot of people don't, and if you're coming to ballet for the first time, I really think these things would just be helpful to learn. But unfortunately, they're just not taught outright in class. They're kind of taught through doing a class, because it's really hard to pull this information out and teach it separately from a class. These are things like musicality, ballet insider language, so think about terms like sickling or feeling the floor, then of course the names of the actual steps themselves, knowing that there's four counts before starting, so you tend to have five, six, seven, eight, and then and you'll start an exercise. Knowing if an exercise starts from the back of the class or the corner, there are some that just naturally make sense, but it doesn't naturally make sense. It makes sense because we've been doing it for however many years. So I often see in classes where the teacher is giving an exercise and I know it's gonna start from the back of the room because of all of those years of taking class, but then I'll see 80% of the class move to the corner. So there's a bit of a disconnect to how that's being taught. Now that of course is a small example of how that's happening, but I have seen it with different teachers in different studios. And so while I'm not saying it's happening everywhere, it's happening in some places and I can only assume that it's happening for other people too. And it would be really simple to just say, hey, this exercise is starting from the back and moving to the front. Or this exercise is starting from the corner, it goes to the other corner and comes back. So we need four extra counts of music between the groups so that that group can disperse. Small things like this. And there are some teachers that explain this well and some that don't at all. Basically, if you feel like you've missed the weekend course or the orientation session, you're not alone. Number five is not pushing through the awkward stage. So as you start anything new, you're probably not going to be very good in the beginning. Ballet comes with a funny set of expectations and a very real fear of being bad at it. It's kind of like public speaking, public singing, public dancing. These are categories that we're really scared of being bad at. No one would expect you to pick up a violin and be a prodigy or start an improv group or start drawing or start tennis and be amazing from the get-go. And this is also the case for ballet. So in the beginning, it's really about getting into that first class, coming to the second, coming to the third, etc. I had read somewhere and I don't remember where exactly, but we don't find the motivation and then do the thing. We do the thing and then we get motivation because we get validated either internally, so we enjoy it or we enjoy the challenge of it, or externally where we have people cheering us on because we're trying a new really hard thing. Adults are pretty bad at being bad at things. If you think about it as kids, we're bad at a lot of things. We were bad at reading, we were bad at walking, and eventually we developed the skills and it became second nature to us. And as kids, you start doing more and more activities. Naturally, as you go through the stages of doing these activities, you tend to drop off the ones that you're not as good at. And this is usually motivated by both internal and external validation. So you tend to follow the ones you enjoy, although we do have a bias to enjoy the activities we're good at. And you also tend to follow the activities where you might have external validation. So where you have competitions, where you might have won medals or trophies, or people are telling you you're very good at the thing. Even in academics, we tend to pursue university degrees degrees based on the courses we're good at in school. And so by the time you come to be an adult, it's almost like you're not doing anything that you're bad at anymore. And so it becomes really hard to start something new. And this is the ick stage of ballet or the awkward stage. And things don't necessarily feel easy or feel good yet, but you'll get there. And the more and more you come to class, the easier and easier it gets, I promise. <laughs> Number six is try not to let perfectionism get in the way. If this perfectionism and want to absolutely 
perfectly execute every step is getting in the way. It's just getting in the way of you getting started or restarted. We've all seen those images of a dancer in one position with 500 arrows saying all the things that need to happen in that one standstill photo. Eyes up, chin up, neckline long, shoulders down, rib cage in, spine in line, etc, etc. The thing is, ballet is not a standstill photo. So it can be incredibly overwhelming to see all those things that need to happen in one photo while knowing that ballet is a moving art form. Ultimately, working on this minutia, working on this perfect technique, on this perfect artistry, discovering new things is the infinite game of ballet. And I've spoken about this before and it's something I think about a lot. But in the beginning, I think it's too overwhelming to think about this level of detail. There's this parable from the book Art and Fear of the pottery class and it's kind of well known now. I would say it's used quite widely. There was a pottery class and the teacher divided the class into two groups. So group A and group B. And group A had to make one pot every day for 30 days and group B had to make one pot over the 30 day period. And at the end of 30 days, all of the pots were judged and the top 10 all came from group A. So the group that was doing a pot every single day. And what this tells us is that the rewards of putting in the reps, repeating the process, learning from your mistakes and persisting far outweigh the rewards of trying to theorize exactly what perfection is and then trying only once. Basically in the beginning, I wouldn't worry too much about how to perfectly execute a step. Really the important thing is that you're coming to class and that you're coming to class over and over and that you're putting in the reps, so to speak. All right, and finally, mistake number seven is not getting started. This is probably the most impactful mistake of all. It can be really hard and really scary to try something new, but if you don't start, you just don't know how incredible of a thing this could be for you. It can be really overwhelming to research finding the exact right class and how to best start a new interest or hobby. The easiest thing to do is to just get into a class. And I know it's so much easier said than done, but you could literally just Google ballet classes near me, find one and sign up and try it without thinking too much about it. Or even even simpler, you can find some beginner classes on YouTube. Catherine Morgan has a great selection. I've put a few down below, including a Disney class that is one of my absolute favorites. We all overthink this step, including myself, and then all of our limiting beliefs and all of our fears get in the way, and we start overthinking this. We start thinking, what are other people going to think of this? But actually, no one cares. And I find this really liberating. Everyone is far more concerned with their own experience and what other people are thinking of them. Your first class won't define who you are as a dancer and it won't cement your level of technique. It's just where you're getting started or where you're coming in for your restart. There's this quote, the best time to plant a tree was 10 years ago and the second best time is now. So if you were thinking, oh, I wish I started as a kid or I wish I started 10 years ago, the second best time to start is now. So just get into class. So what are some mistakes that you've made? I'd love if you would leave a comment down below. And if you're curious what's in my ballet bag, click on this video over here and if you're looking for massive ballet inspiration, click on this playlist, which has all of my World Ballet Day videos. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.